qui dove sono io. Cari colleghi, cari allievi, signore e signori, caro Semmai Calatia, vi ringrazio molto di essere qui con noi oggi in questo giorno di festa per la scuola normale superiore. Siamo qui riuniti oggi per onorare un grande studioso che ha dato contributi fondamentali e molto originali alla matematica. Per una scuola come la nostra è necessario additare all'attenzione del mondo della ricerca, ma più in particolare alle nuove generazioni, qui fortunatamente ben rappresentate, personalità che abbiano portato alla ricerca, come è il caso presente, il dono di una personalità aperta e vivace, di una curiosità intellettuale, mobile e attenta al presente, di una dedizione agli studi che abbraccia senza stanchezze e interruzioni l'arco di tutta una vita. La normale è per sua tradizione molto avara di riconoscimenti come questo. Desidero ricordare come i nostri diplomati honoris causa per la classe di scienze siano stati ad oggi soltanto sette. Sir Michael Atia sarà l'ottavo. Lo hanno preceduto in cerimonie di benvenuto e di celebrazione come questa alcune personalità che vorrei qui ricordare per nome. Il professor Tsung Dao Li, il professor Israel Gelfan, il professor Vladimir Arnold, il professor Jean Brossel, il professor Freeman Dyson, il professor Masatoshi Koshiba, il professor Paul George Mayaven. Tutti, come la persona che oggi celebriamo, studiosi di primissimo ordine, che hanno intrattenuto nel tempo rapporti stretti con la normale, i suoi allievi, i suoi docenti. Vorrei ricordare che Sir Michael Attia è stato anche membro del nostro advisory committee negli anni Ottanta. Le personalità che oggi noi stiamo onorando col titolo dottorale di perfezionamento honoris causa, Sir Michael Attia, professore emerito presso l'Università di Edimburgo, i cui grandi meriti scientifici e i cui alti riconoscimenti saranno presentati di qui a poco ci ha fatto l'onore di accettare questo riconoscimento, questa distinzione e di essere qui con noi oggi grazie Sir Michael di aver accolto il nostro invito e di essere oggi qui con noi do ora la parola al professor Fulvio Ricci preside della classe di scienze Michael Francis Attia began his mathematical activity at Trinity College in Cambridge, where he obtained his doctorate and was elected fellow in 1954. After some years spent between Cambridge and Princeton, he moved to Oxford, where in 1963 he was offered the prestigious civilian chair of geometry that he held until 1969. In the following three years, Michael Atiel was professor of mathematics at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton until he moved back to Oxford to remain there until 1990 as a Royal Society professor. In 1990, he became a master at Trinity College in Cambridge. In those years, he promoted the opening in Cambridge of the Isaac Newton Institute for Mathematical Sciences, becoming its first director. Since his retirement, he is honorary professor at the University of Edinburgh. In his career, Michael Atia has held some of the most relevant positions in the scientific community. He was member of the executive committee of the International Mathematical Union from 1971 to 1974 and president of the London Mathematical Society from 74 to 76. In the 80s, he played a major role in the creation of the European Mathematical Society. And when the society was formally constituted in 1990, he became its first individual member. From 1990 to 1995, he served as president of the Royal Society, having himself been elected a fellow at the age of 32. His presidential addresses for the Royal Society gave him the opportunity to discuss the challenges that sciences, science poses for society. He has been otherwise directly involved in activities and initiatives promoting awareness of scientists in modern society, assuming position of high responsibility like the presidentship of the Pugwash Conferences of Science and World Affairs 
from 97 to 2002. The importance of Michael Atiyah's scientific achievements and contributions has been recognized with the assignment of the most important prizes in mathematics. In 1966, he was awarded the Fields Medal during the International Congress of Mathematicians in Moscow. In 2004, he was awarded, together with Isidore Singer, the Abel Prize, motivated by their joint work on the Atiyah Singer Index Theorem. The Royal Society assigned him the Royal Medal in 1968 and the Copley Medal in 1988. He received his knighthood in 1983 and the Order of Merit in 1992. Among the recognitions received in other countries, one must mention the King's Faisal International Prize for Science, the Benjamin Franklin Medal, and the Nehru Medal. In 1981, Michael Atiyah received the Premio Feltrinelli from the Accademia Nazionale dei Lincei, a tribute that was reinforced in 1999 by his appointment as foreign member of the Academy. Michael Atiyah's connection with Scuola Normale began, goes back to the 70s. In 1974, he became a member of the editorial board of the Annali della Scuola Normale Superiore Classe di Scienze, in 75, he was one of the main speakers at the CIME course on differential operators and manifolds organized by Edoardo Vesentini. In the 8th, the Classe di Scienze included him in its advisory committee. The colleagues who were at the school at the time remember his active participation and the attention that he put in hearing the voice of all components of the class, in particular of the students. It was clear that his long experience of Oxbridge, Oxbridge Colleges allowed him to interpret the educational mission of the Scuola Normale to the full. In 78, he visited the Scuola Normale and held the series of Lezioni Fermiane on the geometry of Young, Mill, Young Mills fields. After almost 30 years, the volume containing the subject of these lectures is one of the most requested and cited among the Scuola Normale's publication to witness how influential the work done by Atia in the 70s has been since then. Grazie, Professor Ricci. Do ora la parola per la laudazio al Professor Tomassini. So. <coughs> Michael Atia has promoted, arguably better than any other scientist, the unifying nature of mathematical thought. He has been responsible for a series of breakthroughs which serve as landmarks in the history of mathematics in the second half of the 20th century. Whilst the language of algebraic geometry provided the foundation for a lot of Atia's work, his results bring together geometry, analysis, topology, and number theory in ways that were not even imagined previously. The influence of this result, both in mathematics and theoretical physics, is unsurpassed. Together with Friedrich Hirzebruck, he invented the K-theory, a calculus combining linear algebra, topological spaces, and the group theory. Together with Isidore Singer, he proved the celebrated index theorem, more and more general version of which were developed through the 60s and in decades to follow. Together with the late Raoul Bott, he converted these ideas into a fixed point theorem for maps between manifolds and later carried out a fundamental study of flat connection and their moduli over Riemann surfaces. At about the same time, in the late 70s, he revolutionized the study of four-dimensional geometry in a paper with Singer and his former and first graduate student, Nigel Hitchin. The work on four dimension paved the way for a spectacular theorem of his student, Simon Donaldson, proved, proved in the early 80s, limiting the structure of smooth four manifolds. 
This led Atiyah to become even more, even more involved with the interplay between mathematics and physics. And he speaks of being overwhelmed by the grandeur of a pyramid that had been unearthed by the understanding of modulized basis of solution of differential equation on manifolds. Later, Atiyah developed the concept of a topological quantum field theory to unify the new mathematics that was developing on the borderline with theoretical physics. Together with Edward Witten, he has developed the study of the mathematics underlying dualities in string theory. Quoting his own, own words slight, slightly out of context, Michael Atia is equally skilled at manufacturing the beautiful gems as he is in pushing through the broad concept that together make mathematics such a universal language and art. By the mid-50s, an attempt to interpret the formula of Guido Castelnuovo, Francesco Severi, and the other Italian geometers in describing properties of complex surfaces had helped Hillsbrook to formulate a powerful result in higher dimension based on the Riemann-Roch theorem for a curve, itself a type of a Cauchy residues formula. At the same time, Quinico Kodaira and the others in Princeton were seeking to develop the work of Atiyah's supervisor, William Hodge, on harmonic forms. These provide analogous of the euler poincare characteristic for algebraic varieties. But it was the more abstract approach to these theories adopted by Jean-Pierre Serre and Alexander Grothendieck that led Atiyah and Hirzbruck to invent K-theory. Atiyah had met Hirzbruck in Princeton, and they began a more intense collaboration following Atiyah's return to England in 57 to a mathematical climate increasing dominated by new ideas in topology. K-theory helped John Frank Adams solve the vector field problem on spheres and convert the periodicity theorem of both on the homotopy classes of Lie groups into a simple multiplicative property. Periodicity also plays a role in Clifford algebras and Atiyah's famous paper with both and, and Arnold Shapiro has provided the starting point for many students of algebra, analysis, and geometry, wanting, wanting to, learn, uh, to learn about the Dirac operator and the spinors. The, the latter are square roots of more tangible vectors, and they were used extensively by Roger Penrose in quantum gravity, attempting to reconcile the contrasting real and the complex nature of general relativity and quantum theory. His twister theory was later, later adopted by Atiyah and Richard Ward as a key step in the classification of instantons. K-theory also provided the language for one of the most celebrated and far-reaching theorem in mathematics, namely, namely the Atiyah-Singer index theory a theorem which unified and absorbed many results that had emerged in the 50s. The deep links between higher mathematics and physics continue to, to be a constant theme in Atiyah's work. He emphasized the duality between symmetric and anti-symmetric operation, an analog of a supersymmetry, supersymmetry theories between bosons and the fermions in physics. It is an idea it is an idea that, that underlies the formulation of the fixed point theorem, proved jointly with the bot in 64 at completing the trilogy of results cited in connection with his field medal awarded in Moscow in 66. The fixed point theorem is obtained by associating to a map between compact manifold and index consisting of an alternating so, uh, sum of traces of induced linear maps, and in special cases, reduced to both the veil character formula for the groups and the left sheds fixed point theorem. So, 
the classification of Istanton over the four-dimensional sphere was a triumph of detective work that was finished almost simultaneously by Atia and Ichin in Oxford and Vladimir Greenfield, a Yuri Manin in Moscow. The resulting ADHM construction, as it quickly became called, solved the problem that in the end had been reduced to algebraic geometry, but which had much wider implications. Atia Lezioni Fermiane, held at the Scuola Normale in 78, provided an excellent summary of this theory and made wide use of geometrical tools ranging from quaternions to second fundamental forms. The classification of Istantons signaled the arrival of related results such as Alexander Bailinson classification of holomorphic Berton bundle on projective space and led to an interest in moduli or parameter space outside of algebraic geometry. The study of moduli spaces as manifold in their own right and now present one of the most important activities of geometers and theoretical physicists. The rigorous mathematical theory of young male fields was developed around 80 in the influential paper of Atiyah and Bot, in which Moore's theory was applied to prove, amongst other things, a conjecture by Peter Newsted, another former student of Atiyah, concerning vanishing Pontryagin numbers. But, as well, as well as other such, such as Aldo Andreotti, had championed the widespread use of Morse theory by means of which the topology of a manifold is encoded and localized by behavior at its critical points or submanifolds. The dual way in which one can often describe a given moduli space was exploited by other students, including Francis Kirwan and Donaldson, following ideas of Hermann Weil and the theorem of Narasimha and Seshadri for bundles of a Riemann surface. Both worked extensively on moment mapping, mapping, a theme that was to remain one of Atiyah's favorites. Donaldson went on to push the theory of a moduli space to its limit for the first time since the exotic example of John Milner, the vast difference between differential differentiable and topological classification of manifolds became clear. There were unlimited consequences for the theory of algebraic surfaces that have been developed by Fabrizio Catanese and others. Morse theory was soon to find new application in the work of Witten, whose work began to be intertwined with that, with that of Atiyah in the 80. The eighth equation provided a new proof of the Morse inequalities that swept away many of the complications inherent in the earlier approaches. It led, it led on to the concept of topological quantum field theory, or that Atiyah, Graham Siegel, and the other mathematicians started devoting their time to develop rigorously. This universal concept encompassed both Donaldson theory and the work of Vogum. Jones on Knott polynomials and, around this time, the theory of cyber Witten invariance simplified many mathematical proofs. The resulting theory is a perfect blend of algebraic complex and differential geometry and was the subject that Michael Attia chose to speak about at a conference for Edoardo Vesentini at the Scuola Normale in 88. Atiyah's collected works were published in five volumes by Oxford University Press in 1901, but, but his scientific production continues unabated. His eventual retirement to Edinburgh in 97 marked the renewed appearance of a stream of original papers. Michael Atiyah recognized no boundary in geometry, and would be skeptical of distinction that persists between school of algebraic, complex, and differential geometry. He has continually emphasized the relevance of differential geometry in the equation of mathematical physics, physics in particular those of Maxwell and Einstein, and their links with modern mathematical theories.
Grazie professor Tomassini. Leggerò ora la formula di rito per il conferimento del diploma honoris causa di perfezionamento e poi chiederò al professor Attia di tenere la sua lezione inaugurale. Visto lo statuto della scuola e le norme di legge sul conferimento dei titoli accademici honoris causa, vista la proposta della classe di scienze matematiche, fisiche e naturali e la deliberazione del Consiglio Direttivo del 10 luglio 2003, vista l'approvazione del Ministro dell'Istruzione dell'Università e della Ricerca, noi conferiamo a Sir Michael Attia il diploma di perfezionamento honoris causa in matematica per aver portato nella matematica moderna un altissimo contributo di idee unificanti e innovative, influenzando così grandemente lo sviluppo di numerose branche della matematica e della fisica teorica. Un applauso per... Well, first, I would like to thank the Scuola Normale very much for honoring me with this degree in this way. <clears throat> uh, as you heard, I had long connections with the Scuola Normale over many years, and this is a, a nice to, that you remembered me in my retirement and brought me all the way down from Edinburgh to take part in this grand ceremony here today in this magnificent uh, building that you have. So I'm enjoying my visit again after so many years. Uh, I have, uh, the price I have to pay for this, receiving this honorary degree is, of course, that I have to give you a lecture, and the price you pay, you have to listen to it. Uh, but you needn't worry, uh, this is not an occasion for a technical lecture with demanding formulae and equations. It's an occasion for a general lecture, uh, which can be understood, hopefully, by people from many disciplines. Uh, my title is Geometry and Physics, but in fact, I will adopt uh, an approach which is also historical and philosophical. Um, uh, very, from the very beginning of the study of science and philosophy, the connection between the reality of the world outside and the human mind has been a perennial theme for philosophers. And in particular, the relationship between the physics, as understood by physicists carrying out experiments, and the mathematicians who write down formulae and equations, what is the connection between reality and the mathematics that we use to describe it. These are problems that started many thousands of years ago, and so if I press the right button here, we will find out. Let's see. Let's see this one. There we go. Uh, Aristotle and Plato uh, studied the, the mathematics and also the philosophy underlying these questions, and although we don't have um, contemporary portraits of Aristotle and Plato, we have the next best thing, the famous painting by Raphael of the School of Athens, and in the middle, the two central figures are supposed to be Plato and Aristotle. Um, it's a very beautiful picture anyway. It hangs on my walls of my own room in my flat in Edinburgh. Um, now, uh, I said, these questions of philosophers started in that time, and for a thousand years, the ideas of Pla Aristotle ruled the, the world until the modern era, and, and the modern era, for many purposes, can be taken to begin with Galileo, a portrait that you will be very familiar with. Um, and I was very pleased when I arrived at the airport to see here that the airport is called after Galileo. Uh, I knew, of course, that he carried out his famous experiments in the leading tower of Pisa. I didn't realize until I came that he was actually born in Pisa. Uh, so it's very appropriate that I should start with the picture of Galileo. Um, <clears throat> now, as you know, his experiment was to drop uh, different objects from the leaning tower and take how long they came to fall down and contradicting the theory of Aristotle which said that heavier objects would travel faster 
he discovered that they travel at the same speed. Actually, that's not quite correct. History books sometimes simplify things. In practice, heavier objects do travel a little faster because of air resistance. But that's a small correction, and Galileo understood about that, so he ignored that. He, and he, the theory is he found that everything hit the ground at the same time. That's the famous story of the uh, history of science. Um, now, there are many stories about Galileo. I'm sure you know many stories. Uh, but one story you probably don't know, and I will tell you. Um, I was, as you heard, uh, some years the master of Trinity College, Cambridge, where I had been a student, and the college which is uh, where Newton studied and many famous people after him. And in the war, on the halls of the main master's lodge in Trinity College, there are many portraits of Newton and other famous people. And there is also a portrait of Galileo. Now, you may think this is a bit of cheating. Galileo was not a student in Cambridge. Uh, but there is a reason why he was there. The master of the college at the time was, had been a student of Newton, and he wanted to propagate the scientific ethos in Cambridge. So he found a very talented uh, Scottish painter called uh, Ramsey, who was going out to study in Italy. He said, when you go to Italy, please get me back a copy of a painting of Galileo. So Ramsey went. He went to Florence. He went to Rome. And he made a beautiful picture of Galileo. Not a copy, but his own interpretation. That was hanging on the walls of Trinity College. He's been there for 250 years, so it's now established. Um, and ne next to that portrait, I had at the time put another picture, which was a picture of uh, Harvard College, Harvard University, when it first started, very early on. And I put the two together because most people think that Harvard University belongs to the modern era and Galileo belongs to the Middle Ages, centuries apart. But in fact, if you look carefully at the dates, Galileo died in the important year of 1642, the year that Isaac Newton was born. And Harvard University was founded in 1636, only 20 years after the Pilgrim Fathers landed in America. So the story goes that the president of Harvard at the time took to his dean of science and said, get me the best physicists in the world. And the dean said, well, there's this chap called Galileo in Italy. I understand he's having a little trouble with the church. So perhaps we can persuade him to come to Harvard. So they made him an offer, but Galileo, you know, an old man, he looked at the sea, and traveling in those days was not so easy, so after a long time he, he declined the offer. Well, that's a nice story, uh, you can believe it or not, uh, <laughs> but what it, what it does show is that theoretically it was possible, the dates overlapped, Harvard and Galileo actually overlapped in a period of time, that's why I put the two pictures together. Now. Uh, the ne after after uh, Galileo, uh, the next big step forward in the development of physical science was, of course, due to Isaac Newton. Uh, and I think this represented the shift between the great period of uh, intellectual and artistic history in Renaissance Italy into 17th century England. And that move was probably partly due to the fact that the church's influence was not so strong in England and scientists could say what they liked without danger of being summoned by the Pope. Um, uh, so Newton's, uh, of course, great theory was uh, uh, to, I mean, monumental work was first of all the universal law of gravitation, that particles attract themselves, each other, by the inverse square law. Um, and secondly, the development of the calculus as a technical tool in which to work out the consequences of this fundamental formula, and in particular to work out the elliptical orbits of the planets, motion around the sun. These were the two great achievements uh, of Isaac Newton. Um, and the two things I want to comment about Newton's work is that the, uh, Newton wrote in a very geometrical fashion. People find it very hard to read Newton's work now. Uh, he, he combined calculus with geometry in a way that uh, was very uh, visual because you had things moving around in curves, you had tangents to lines, and detailed ge formula proofs written in the language of Euclidean geometry, um, which is very different from the other approach to calculus developed by Leibniz, which became, in fact, the more popular work on which modern techniques are based, the formalism of differential calculus, very algebraic approach. And these two schools of thought, the difference between Newton's approach and Leibniz's approach, are actually very fundamental differences. For Newton, the world outside was what he wanted to study, planets, orbits, move things moving, and geometry was the language to describe that. And so he wanted everything to be described in geometrical terms, 
so that the relationship between the mathematics and the physics will be easy to see. If you go to a formalist algebraic approach like Nybitz does, you may gain much in the sense of mathematical uh, simplicity, formulas and calculation, but you lose the uh, insight and connection between the mathematics and the physical reality. And that distinction, which dates from that time, carries all the way through to the present time. There are these two different points of view. One tries to keep the mathematics close to the physics, the other tries to develop mathematics by itself in the most uh, elegant algebraic way. And both are still with us at the present time. Now, one of the things Newton did very carefully when he wrote his book about gravi universal gravitation was he said, basically, um, I don't understand how things can attract themselves at a distance, how this force works, but if you assume that this works, here are the consequences. He didn't want to say that he believed that uh, particles attracted each other by a force, because that might get him into trouble with the church. Even in England, you have to be careful what you said. Uh, so he was very careful to protect himself by this statement that all he was doing was saying, if you have an inverse square law, then you find that the consequences are like this, you find that planets will go around the ellipses, and everything is, con is very nice. He didn't say, I know how gravitation works. He was very careful. And in fact, he was very wise to be careful, because Newton was actually secretly um, unorthodox in his religious views. He, what is, he was in Trinity College, and I don't know, in Italy you use the same phrase, the Trinity, you know, <laughs> Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, but uh, he was what is called a Unitarian, which didn't believe in this complicated notion of the Trinity, uh, but he had to keep quiet about it. But one of his successors, also a professor of mathematics, was uh, not so reticent, and he was eventually deprived of his post as professor. So even in, Engl in England, you could lose your job if you were not careful what you said. Now, uh, moving on, rapidly from Newton to the next great breakthrough in uh, physics, we can move on really for 200 years. Uh, the period after Newton was the period where the mathematical treatment of uh, gravitation and forces, dynamics, was all beautifully worked out by the great uh, mathematicians of the time, Laplace and Lagrange, famous Italian mathematician, as you know. Um, but the, the, they were all developing further mathematical consequences of Newtonian dynamics. But the next fundamental change came late, later on from James Clerk Maxwell, whose little picture is on the side there. And on the left hand other side, there's a picture in Edinburgh, which I will tell you about in a moment. First, I should like to emphasize that Maxwell was also in Trinity College, uh, as well as Newton. But he had, before that, been in Edinburgh, which is where I now am. So he had, I have links with both sides. Um, and James Clerk Maxwell is regarded as the founder of electromagnetic theory and the modern civilization as we know it, from your mobile phone to the computers, all rests on his fundamental work. But uh, he is not very widely recognized. There is no memorial to him in Edinburgh. And so I'm very pleased to tell you that there will be a memorial to him. And there will be a statue uh, erected in Edinburgh in one of the very prominent streets. And this is a picture showing you where the statue will be and what it'll look like, taken from, you don't, if you don't know Edinburgh, you don't know, but this is a famous street, uh, one of the, what is called Edinburgh Newtown, built in the early uh, 19th century, very classical style of building, uh, and there are a row of statues already, but those statues are statues of kings and prime ministers and people like that. So to add a statue of a great intellectual, you think is an improvement, and he will look down this avenue, and the Royal Society of Edinburgh, which I'm now the president, is the building in there which has the dome, and it's not very far from where Maxwell will sit. So I hope you approve this uh, addition, architecture and science together. And when I came here and saw your magnificent piazza outside, and I thought to myself, well, if we can have Maxwell in Edinburgh, why can't you have Galileo here in Pisa? And I mentioned it to you. Uh, and I think the idea has, has occurred to other people. All you've got to do is to find a good sculptor who will put the right kind of statue in the right kind of place, and then you have to spend many years persuading the local uh, authorities that this is an acceptable proposition. But if you work on it, uh, you will succeed. So I encourage you. I hope next time I come to Pisa, you will have a statue of uh, Galileo here outside. 
<coughs> now, uh, Maxwell's uh, not only laid, laid down the fundamental equations of electromagnetism, but he also introduced a new fundamental concept, uh, uh, namely the electromagnetic field, which sits outside in space, is thought of as an object in its own right. There are fields in space, and the fields are the important things that live in even in empty space. And this was a totally different philosophical point of view from the point of view that you only had objects, particles, which attracted each other at a distance. That picture went away, and instead you had this picture of fields. And I should say that the original picture of action at a distance always troubled philosophers. How can things act at a distance? How can one object here know about another object very far away in the universe and uh, you know, attract it or repel it? And so this was always a matter of dispute and Newtonian theory was not fully accepted by people on the continent who believed in Descartes' theory of vortices and so on. It, and in fact, you have to, people nowadays say how stupid they were not to accept Newtonian theory, but at the time, you have to think in terms of the philosophical objections if there was no understanding of what gravitational attraction meant, it was not an easy theory to work with. Newton disregarded the philosophy and said, let's do the mathematics. But if you worried about the philosophy, then you had cause for concern. Well, the electromagnetic field was an improvement. It was something in space. It didn't involve things attracting at a distance. But it also had a problem. If you have an electromagnetic field, it's like a wave. But a wave usually travels through some medium, water, air, uh, and so what, the, what medium does the electromagnetic field travel in? Well, the answer was there was something hypothetical called the ether. The ether was meant to be empty space, but somehow some kind of elastic body that could vibrate, and the vibrations of this body represented the electromagnetic wave. And that was very satisfying if you believed the ether really existed. But there was no evidence for the ether, and people looked for evidence for the ether, and finally, as you probably know, there was the famous experiment of Michelson and Morley, which showed there could be no such ether. Fundamental uh, experiments were made which showed there was a contradiction. So the ether quietly has disappeared. We are still left with the electromagnetic field. It's a beautiful theory, but it doesn't vibrate anywhere. It vibrates in empty space. So in some ways, the philosophical objections are still there. Now, what does it really mean uh, to have a, a field in totally empty space? Now, after Maxwell, many other things happened, but within... Uh, <clears throat> a short period of time we came to Einstein and Einstein as you know first of all uh, he produced his special theory of relativity which, combining space and time but beyond that he went on to his general theory of relativity which explains gravitation from a totally new point of view a point of view much more in line with Maxwell's explanation of electromagnetic theory the idea was that space-time is four-dimensional, but it can be curved, and the curvature represents gravitational field. The gravitational field is, becomes simply the shape of space, empty space. So space is now acquiring a marvelous collection of properties. It can transmit electromagnetic waves, and it can curve on itself, which represents the gravitational field. All of these marvelous things happy, happen out in empty space. It's, it's a very difficult philosophical notion. Uh, and, of course, the ideas of curvature of space <clears throat> are old mathematically. Gauss uh, was interested in curvature of curved geometries. He gave to Riemann the problem of trying to develop a theory of what would happen if space was really curved. That was not space-time, that was space. And <clears throat> Gauss even, uh, Riemann, of course, worked out magnificently the foundations of what we now call Riemannian geometry, which subsequently became the framework for Einstein to adopt uh, as, for general relativity. And in, even Gauss, who was, a, as you know, fully employed as an astronomer, and his job was to measure things, he actually proposed to measure the Earth, uh, I mean, the space from points on mountains, to see whether the, the space was flat or curved. And he found it was flat, but that, to the order of approximation he was doing, it was flat. Only on a large scale of the universe do you find the curvature that Einstein was talking about. <clears throat> <clears throat> now, um, <clears throat> this is a very, you know, I, I only have, I think, uh, 40 minutes or something like this, you'll be pleased to know, and I have to cover the whole history of physics and philosophy from Aristotle, Plato, down to the present time, so I have to move fast. <clears throat> so I have to move on after Einstein a little bit. Shortly after Einstein, oh, um, <clears throat> 
came Hermann Weyl, who was a great mathematician, uh, one of the mathematicians I particularly uh, admire, and he, very shortly after Einstein produced his work uh, on general relativity, proposed uh, a, a generalization of that work which combined Einstein's work with Maxwell's work in a very beautiful mathematical formalism. Um, his idea was that the length of objects, like measuring rods, if you transport these through a strong gravitational field, they can change their length. And this change of length, he called a gauge shift, and this was meant to be re represent the, sorry, the, 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 that was the electromagnetic field. And the electromagnetic field, sorry, if you have a rod which you move in an electromagnetic field, then it changes its, its length. It's a beautiful theory, the equations work out lovely, everything works beautifully. Unfortunately, when he sent the paper for publication, the editor consulted Einstein, and Einstein said, there's a fundamental flaw here, <coughs> because if that were the case, then the measurements you make of various physical objects, like atoms and so on, would depend on their past history, and we find that all atoms of hydrogen look the same. So clearly this must be wrong. But very interestingly, the paper was not rejected. Uh, even though Einstein said this is physically wrong, the paper was published, but with the appendix by Einstein saying this is obviously wrong. Now, <coughs> yeah, you, must, you must admire both the persistence of the author, in going on to publish a paper which Einstein said was wrong, and the tolerance of the editor to uh, allow this, and uh, the good nature of Einstein not to object. It's a marvelous combination of um, circumstances. And it has a nice uh, addition to the story, because a few years later, when quantum mechanics appeared, people gave a new interpretation to Weyl's idea. Instead of talking about length being changed as you go around in the magnetic field, they talked about phase, <coughs> which comes into quantum mechanics, <coughs> being shifted. And phase, like an angle, has no physical meaning. You don't, you don't measure it. And therefore, it's no contradiction to have that with physical reality. So with one swoop of the reinterpretation, mathematically, you put an i in somewhere, the square root of minus 1. And now the formulas look the same, but the physical meaning has changed, and they're consistent with physics. And the Weyl's paper has now been resurrected as the starting point of what is called modern gauge theory, the beginning of modern physics as been, since that time, all hinges on that paper of Hermann Weyl's. If it had been turned down <coughs> by the editor on the ground that it was wrong, physics would have been sent back a long way. So it shows that you have to be careful how you interpret um, things being wrong. And this brings me to another uh, remark of Hermann Weyl's, which I like very much. Um, Hermann Weyl, when asked about what were his um, objectives in doing mathematics, his aims, he said, I always aim for things which are for searching for the truth and for beauty. But if there is a conflict between the two, I choose beauty. Now, people think for a mathematician this is terrible. Mathematicians are meant to be looking for truth, proof. What's this idea of wasting your time looking at beauty? But you see, <coughs> as this example shows, Sometimes your idea of beauty wins out because the truth is more complicated than you think. You don't know the truth. And philosophically, I put it this way around. Uh, there are things called objective and subjective. Subjective is what you feel yourself and is regarded as being uh, you know, personal and not really scientific. Objective is what is out there. It's meant to be common to everybody. So when you have a choose between objective and subjective, you should choose the objective one. Truth is objective, beauty is subjective. But exactly for that reason, you can turn the argument the other way. Uh, as you know, <coughs> uh, appreciation of beauty is a very personal thing. I can find something beautiful, you may disagree. As the Romans said, no, de gustus non est disputandum. So uh, I know, if something is, appears to be beautiful, I know I'm right. But if you're searching for the truth, that's much harder to find. The truth can change, facts can alter, uh, you don't know, you're never certain of the truth, but you can be certain of beauty. For that reason, it's wise to follow your own inclinations, because that may lead you in the right direction. Eventually, you'll get to the truth uh, by some different route. That's my interpretation of Weil's uh, statement. <clears throat> now, after this uh, period of Einstein, then came, as I mentioned before, the 
Uh, well, I think I've got Heisenberg in the wrong place. But my, no, this is meant to be, I think, I, my son did all these pictures for me, and I hope he got them right. Um, this is meant to be Niels Bohr. If you, anybody knew Niels Bohr, you might recognize him as a young man. Usually we see him as an older man. Um, when quantum mechanics appeared on the scene in the 1920s, it was a very revolutionary um, new basis for physics. It was very successful. It became remarkably successful in explaining the experimental facts then known and subsequently discovered. Uh, but it was very difficult to understand. And Einstein, in particular, never accepted quantum mechanics as a fundamental theory. He argued that it was a good theory, it worked, but it wasn't fundamental. It wasn't the ultimate solution. You had to go deeper. And all his life, he believed that until the end. And for a long time, he carried on a famous correspondence with Niels Bohr, where Einstein would make some objection to quantum mechanics, and Bohr would reply, and then Einstein would make another objection, and Bohr would reply again. And this went on ping-pong for many years. Very, and very deep thoughts went into that correspondence. Most physicists will now say that Bohr won the match. But you know, time will tell whether Einstein was right or not. Uh, certainly, all physicists accept quantum mechanics, uh, and they, they use it every day. The question of whether it is the ultimate uh, reality is another matter. And I tend to sympathize with Einstein, and I'm prepared to wait for another 100 years, and uh, we'll see then. History will tell us whether Einstein was fundamentally right or not. Um, the, the, re the problem with quantum mechanics is that it, it's philosophically very difficult to understand. It has a formalism which is mathematically very elegant and very beautiful, which mathematically works out a set of rules, and these rules lead to things you can test experimentally, so it appears to satisfy all the requirements of a good physical theory. You have ru initial rules, mathematical equations, experimental results. Where it is weak is in the first step, the philosophical foundations. And if you're worried about philosophy, you worry about quantum mechanics. If you don't worry about philosophy, you forget that. You accept quantum mechanics. That's the choice. And most physicists nowadays, on the whole, uh, accept quantum mechanics and don't worry too much about it, except a few and except sometimes. Uh, this is Richard Feynman, one of the most famous physicists of recent times, who was also given to making very provocative remarks. And he was, of course, he used quantum theory. He was one of the pioneers of quantum electrodynamics. But he is quoted as saying, nobody understands quantum mechanics. I mean, he had, he had no mis misgivings. He, he knew that nobody understood it. It depends what you mean by understanding. He could use it. He got results. He believed he was correct in some sense, but he did not understand it. And he did not think anybody else understood it. He was, he was quite categorical on that statement too. So physicists really use it, but they don't really understand what it's about. Now, this is another famous physicist of the time, Paul Dirac. I went to Dirac's lectures when I was a young student. Um, and uh, he was uh, uh, introduced fundamental new ideas beyond early quantum mechanics. He was the big, really the founder of what is called quantum field theory, where you not only replace particle movement by quantum mechanical systems, but you replace field theory, electromagnetic system, by uh, quantum versions of those. And the quantum field theory that Dirac developed and became subsequently standard it is a very even more bizarre than the quantum mechanics. Because in quantum field theory, this vacuum outside that, that uh, oh, that was my diploma, I must get that back. Um, quantum field theory uh, says that the vacuum outside, which we know already has a very bizarre property, it carries electromagnetic waves, it can be curved in gravitational fields, but Dirac said, in addition to all that, it is constantly fluctuating. It is creating annihilating particles all the time, though there are fireworks going off in the sky. So the vacuum, far from being a dull, empty place, is actually full of exciting things all the time in an unpredictable way. But it, so the, the nature of understanding gets harder and harder. How can you understand that? You can write down mathematical formulas which say this is what's happening. These are the predictions. But understanding it, is another matter. So quantum mechanics, quantum field theory, get harder and harder to understand. And when I was in, uh, you heard that I was in Princeton for some years, the Institute for Advanced Study, I arrived in 1955, which was unfortunately the year that Hermann Weyl died. I never had a chance to meet him, although I heard him talk at the International Congress in Amsterdam in 1954. Um, but, um, and also 
another great physicist at the time, uh, John von Neumann, died. Um, but somebody who was, was alive and carried on and was, when I was there was uh, another famous logician, Kurt Gödel, who, as uh, you know, was one of the, the great logicians who really upset all the fundamental ideas about the basis of mathematical logic and foundations of mathematics. Um, and was in Princeton for most of his latter part of his life. Uh, he was a great friend of Einstein, in fact. They used to go for walks together, uh, talk, no doubt, in German, and about the good old days. Uh, there was, and I think Hermann Weil was more or less Gödel's only friend. Gödel was very much a recluse. He, he, had, he was very paranoid about things, but he and Einstein were great friends. And in fact, Gödel, for a while, worked on relativity. He produced some interesting solutions of Einstein's equations. Um, so he was quite seriously interested in gravitational theory. And I once, uh, at some dinner at the Institute in Princeton, I sat next to Gödel. I was still a young man, and he was a uh, famous physician. Anyway, he, he, we start, got talking a bit about physics. And he turned to me and said, the trouble with uh, physicists nowadays is they don't, no longer attempt to explain. They only describe. They don't, don't try to explain. They just describe, which means that they, exactly what I've been saying, there's no understanding, there's no explanation in that sense, only a description. If you do this, these are the formulae. And that was his criticism, and it's shared, I think, by Einstein too. But uh, in some ways, ever since Newton, people haven't really understood what they're doing in physics. All they're doing is to describe the universe with more and more complicated descriptions. <clears throat> now, I started off by talking about the philosophers and Aristotle and then I moved on the to the physicists, the mathematicians. Let me come back to the philosophers. Uh, this is David Hume, another Edinburgh man. There's a statue of David Hume, I'm glad to say, in Edinburgh already, by the same sculptor that is going to do the statue of Clark Maxwell. David Hume was a, a great um, empiricist. He believed that all knowledge came from looking at the world outside. All our information really was extracted by examining the world we lived in. He didn't believe in things happening inside the human mind. It was all outside in the outside world. He was a very straightforward um, empiricist. Um, on the other hand, uh, the other great philosopher after him was Immanuel Kant. And Kant, uh, who many people think is the greatest philosopher of all time, he modified Hume's views. He said, yes, much of what we know comes from the outside world, but there's some things, some a priori knowledge, which is in our own mind, which we know without having to look outside and make experiments. And he tries to distinguish between these two. I have to say, uh, Kant is very difficult to read, uh, certainly in the original German, even in English. Uh, and he, part of the reason is he dealt with these very difficult concepts, and he also changed his mind throughout his life. So he, he was not a stationary target. Uh, but as, as I can understand it, he was trying to get this synthesis between the a priori school and the practice empiricist school, and he had a very complicated uh, balance where some things were ex experimental and some things were purely internal. Uh, as mathematics developed after that time, so one thing he thought was inbuilt a priori knowledge was our, the notion of space. He thought the notion of space is in our brains. Uh, but subsequent development of mathematics after Kant's time showed the existence of non-Euclidean geometry. Geometry was not always Euclidean geometry. You could have non-Euclidean geometry. And eventually, Einstein came along and said, actually, the universe is not Euclidean. I mean, it's not, it's not a different kind of geometry. So how could it be built into our brains if, in fact, there's more than one solution? There's not more than one geometry. So Kant was, was wrong. That's the view of people who say that the evolution of physical theory undermined Kant's ideas about space. But in fact, if you think more carefully, that's not a very correct interpretation either. And recent research, which I'll come to later on, <coughs> about neurophysiology, shows that actually, in some sense, it, uh, in our brains do have some uh, apriola knowledge. Of course, that's built up out of knowledge we acquire uh, from the outside world. It may not be applicable in regimes like general relativity and so on. So modern science, in some ways, goes back towards supporting Kant's interpretation. Now, this is a picture of, 
I hope I get the pictures there correspond to my pictures here, yes, they do, uh, of Eugene Wigner, who was a physicist, Hungarian physicist, who got the Nobel Prize. And um, <clears throat> Wigner was a mathematical physicist. He used a lot of mathematics. And he was re reputed as referring to the <clears throat> unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics and physics. He's saying physicists use mathematics, but somehow it becomes much more, that predicts much more than they would think. You, you take some simple a lot of physics, you put it into your equations, and suddenly you find the equations take over, and they tell you things that you couldn't have guessed, thought of at all. For a simple example is, of course, the inverse square law. You put in the inverse square law, you think it's a harmless law, and suddenly it predicts orbits of ellipses around the, around the uh, sun. <coughs> so the mathematics takes over and predicts things far beyond what you, what you start. Also, <coughs> all, large parts of physics can find this out. That the mathematics somehow tells them what's going to happen later on, uh, way beyond what they've guessed. Mathematics has a life of its own. And he thought of this was a great mystery. How does this mathematics do this? Well, another example is Maxwell's equations. When Maxwell wrote down his equations, they're a beautiful set of equations, and from the shape of the equations, he was able to work out not only the currently known facts about electricity and magnetism, he was able to predict that light was an electromagnetic phenomenon because it appeared in the equations. The equations showed him, or predicted this fact, which was subsequently I was verified as well. So mathematics can have a, uh, a remarkable, um, uh, um, give remarkable consequences way beyond what you think. <coughs> now, one, one explanation for um, <coughs> why mathematics is so successful goes that, a bit like Hume's view, um, it depends on evolution. The human mind has evolved and it's evolved in such a way that it's consistent with nature so we can survive in, in the jungle and not get eaten by lions and tigers. So it has to be, who has to work. So our brains work, develop a theory which is pra practical and consistent with the physical world. Otherwise, we would not be here. But the weakness of that argument is that we don't live in the subatomic region. We don't live in the galactic region. Our, we live as human beings in a certain size. And there are things much bigger than us and things much smaller than us. There are telescopes and there are microscopes. And the mathematical theories we work out for the everyday life still seem to work at these enormously big scales and the enormously small scales. That is a surprise. And in some sense, there's no explanation for that unless you just think that God wanted to make life easy for us and not make it too difficult. So he wrote down one set of laws right across the whole universe. <clears throat> now, moving on from the, the, the classical periods to the more modern periods, and I probably only allowed myself five minutes for this, that's fine. Um, the great problem of the present time is how to combine uh, quantum mechanics and general relativity. As Einstein observed, really, general relativity is a beautiful geometrical theory of space, gravitation, electromagnetic theory also included, but <clears throat> the quantum theory is of a totally different kind. It has different rules, different structure, and they appear to be different worlds, and how to combine quantum theory and general relativity remains the great challenge for physicists at the moment. And physicists have been working on this for 30 years or more, <coughs> trying to work out a solution. And string theory, <coughs> which you may have heard, based on the idea that fundamental objects in the universe are not par particles, but strings, one-dimensional things. And moreover, they move not in, only in space-time dimensions, which are four dimensions, but they move in higher dimensions. There are 10 or 11 dimensions, and most of the dimensions are so small you don't see them. But these strings which vibrate and move in these 10 or 11 dimensional spaces are meant to reproduce all the problems of both quantum mechanics and general relativity. <clears throat> and string theory has been <clears throat> remarkably successful in many ways. It does formally produce the right kind of equations. It does <clears throat> unite uh, general relativity and quantum theory in many ways. But it's by no means finished. Um, one of the things that's not finished is that uh, you, they get many different theories. Many, and you have different pictures which lead to the same results. Uh, there are what are called dualities, which explain one result, looking one way, look at it another way, you get the same results from a different point of view. <clears throat> the most famous example of that is in <clears throat> ordinary classical physics and dynamics, where you can look at either the position of particles or the momentum, the velocity. And Heisenberg, uh, of the uncertainty principle, says you can't actually look at both at once totally accurately. You focus on one picture or the other. These are two different pictures, and they give you the same physics, but they're very different pictures. 
dual pictures. This is linear duality. But there are many more complicated dualities in present theories, so the reference in some of the talks earlier to, <coughs> to the Yang Mills theory and Zyberg Witten theory. These are examples of very, very different looking theories which give the same result. And so what does it mean if one of these was a fundamental theory of the universe? What does it mean about reality? What is reality? You know, is reality one of the pictures or the other picture? Or do we have to have a split personality and think of both pictures as reality? So the question of what reality is becomes even more relevant now than it was in the time of Plato and Aristotle. We know more and it's more difficult to fit all the different facts into a picture you call it is reality. <clears throat> so, um, in a sense, the fundamental difficulties are still the same. The human science is really not um, meant, is not a sort of a, um, mechanical process. Science is meant to be the human, attempts by the human mind to understand the world outside. All science is trying to understand the world outside in a way that our brains can appreciate. So there are two points of view. This is the brain, the mind, and the outside world. And science is a, a way of moving from one to the other. And so the question is, what is an understanding? Understanding usually means that we have some concepts, some ideas, some pictures in our mind, which uh, we apply to the outside world, which help us to understand what's going on. Understanding itself is a very difficult notion. What is understanding? Um, mathematical formulae and equations are not a part of understanding, but they're not the whole thing. So you, you, and physicists have this combination of things. They use pictures, concepts, particles, fields, and they don't quite know what they mean. They say, if you're pressed, here's the formula. So there's a gap between the understanding the concept and writing down the equations. And that, that is still with us. Now, it may be that eventually uh, we will make more progress. We'll go back to the kind of world that Einstein and Gödel wanted where we get real understanding, real explanation. At the moment, we don't have that. We have descriptions, more and more complicated descriptions. Descriptions involving more and more complicated mathematics, which is beautiful mathematics. We mathematicians like this. First of all, it makes us feel good that we can help the physicists solve their problems. And sometimes we learn from the physicists new ideas which would help to solve our problems. So it's very profitable for the mathematicians to interact with the physicists. But in terms of understanding the real world outside, the problem is still open. We don't really know how that goes. <clears throat> Now, I mentioned earlier on that uh, well, the human mind is trying to understand nature. That's what science is about. So understanding the human mind itself, which is part of nature, is part of that process. How does the human mind work? Well, now we're beginning to answer that question. Modern neuroscience can now begin to answer questions that philosophers have struggled for thousands of years and come with no answer. <clears throat> so the question that can't ask is any mathematical ability inherent in the human brain? Are we hardwired to do mathematics? Or did we learn all the mathematics from the outside world? Well, now you can begin to answer those questions. <clears throat> a friend of mine is a neurophysiologist, and we talk together, and I've learned a few things. For example, the, one of the most basic notions in mathematics is that of magnitude, big and small. Mathematics starts by saying, this is bigger than that, you know, whatever it is. But that notion is an abstract notion because it can apply to big in size, volume, big in weight, big in intensity of light, big in sound. Lots of things can be measured. Any time you measure them, you're saying this is bigger than that. Measurement is a more precise process, going beyond inequality to giving numbers. So all of all, this notion is the fundamental of all mathematics and eventually to all science. So you can ask, is the brain hardwired understand the notion of magnitude. And so you can carry out experimental tests because now you can, you can do tests, fortunately, without cutting you open. Uh, and you can volunteer and they'll take you into a scanner and, and they'll ask you a question. When you answer the question, something will light up in your brain and they know where it's taking place. So they can test out where thoughts take place. And they, doing this way, you can find out, yes, the brain does have an abstract notion of magnitude. The same signals light up whether you're thinking about big numbers and small numbers, or big volumes and small volumes, there's a common feature to those. So in some sense, the brain is, has an abstract notion of magnitude, which is the first step in the development of mathematics. So if we go, obviously, we'll expect over the next decades to go beyond that, to learn much more about the human brain. As we learn more about how the human brain works, 
we will be able to answer the questions that people like Kant worried about. And are we, how much are we hardwired? How much of it is learned from the outside world? These will be, of course, in some sense, the hardwiring has evolved through the interaction with nature and wasn't, we weren't, microorganisms don't have brains. Uh, but the human brain, when it did evolve, it evolved from its interaction with the outside world. And some part of that has now been preserved in perpetuity for everybody to use. Well, these are the kind of exciting things that we'll, we'll learn about in the future, and eventually, perhaps, we'll understand more how the human brain works. Perhaps mathematicians and physicists will find out more about mathematical theories. So if in 100 years' time you have another lecture here in the Squala Normale, you know, maybe get somebody who will tell you the solutions to these problems. At the moment, all I wanted to say is this history of mathematics and physics has been going on for hundreds of years, and I think it's a long way to go still. It's a very exciting arena, and there's a room in it for young people, I see in the back row a lot of young people there, uh, who carry on and make new discoveries. Some people think sometimes that in the era they live in, science is finished, everything has been discovered, all the work, nothing left for the young people to do. Well, that's wrong, and there are big challenges uh, in all sorts of directions for the young people of the next generations to carry on, and I'm sure the squalor and O'Malley will contribute to that. Thank you.